All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracol here to shine a bit more light on the goings on down south. Tonight, we're going a bit deeper into the philosophical matters that, uh, into the things that are going on around us, and something that I think all of you have been affected by, and that is the lockdown. And it's not even something that is unique to South Africa, it is a global matter, uh, seeing as all countries in the world seem to be following a, a similar formula when it comes to something needs to be done. The approaches might differ, but there is this sense of there needs to be some type of government action. So that a lot of interesting questions arise from that in regards to what how do you go about this how many freedoms uh, should be violated should freedoms be violated uh, and much more so tonight i'm getting into a discussion with mr mark oppenheimer and jason weibelov about their new book lockdown did government do the right thing the big question so uh, just a bit of uh, background, Mark studied philosophy at the University of Cape Town and is a practicing advocate at the Johannesburg Bar, and he's appeared in the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. Uh, Jason is a science fiction author with a PhD in philosophy, and he's also published over a dozen novels and co-hosts the Brain in a Vat Philosophy YouTube channel together with uh, Mr. Oppenheimer here. So welcome to the show, gents. I'm sure you guys will figure out how you, the, the sequence in which you will be answering the questions. But uh, yeah, I actually, uh, this afternoon read through your book. It was very interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, as I told you off air, it gave me a lot of flashbacks to uh, university philosophy. Uh, a lot of the scenarios that you explore are definitely are the bread and butter of uh, any philosophy class. So I think that makes the book very accessible to anyone that's kind of dipping their toe into the, into the pool of philosophy. So maybe before we get into the con the content of the book itself, what what uh, got into you that you wanted to to publish this work? I know you are, you base it on your discussions of, of your podcast, but what made you think that this needs to be presented in this type of format? I think um, podcasts are accessible to some people, um, but people are quite tied to a medium. So some people prefer watching stuff on YouTube, other people like other people like to listen, but but some people really like to read. Um, and the discussion that we had on YouTube was right at the beginning of lockdown, and we thought it was a very important topic. It was actually our opening topic for our for our podcast. It was the first topic we discussed. Um, and then after that, uh, it's now sure almost six months later. Um, and we, we thought it would be great to kind of clarify some of the things that we discussed six months ago. Uh, with uh, with the experience of hindsight um, and uh, kind of formulated into a written book, um, still that's accessible to people, but um, that has more updated information. Um, so, Mark, in regards to the the book's title, did the government do the right thing? Uh, if you were to answer that question in a yes or no, uh, what would your answer be? So, what's interesting is we've tried to encompass two real questions in that, in that question. The one is, did government do uh, the ethical thing? In other words, if it was engaged in a sort of cost-benefit analysis uh, on uh, you know, pleasure and pain or life lost, was it the moral thing to have done? Um, or you know, was it okay to have violated rights in doing so or rights sacrosanct? There's those questions. And then the other question is, is it politically legitimate? In other words, this is done by the state. This is the state backed by the army, backed by the police, telling people what they can do with their lives, where they can go, when they can run their businesses, when they can exercise. And we think that that political legitimacy question is a separate question really from, from the moral. Um, there's another sense in which one might ask the question, which is, was it right at the time? So on the question of, should we have had a lockdown in the beginning? At the time, the feeling was that we were dealing with a virus with an incredibly high mortality rate. The World Health Organization said 3.4% mortality. That's now been uh, revised down quite significantly. I think the Center for Disease Control in the States put it at about 0.65%. Um, Discovery has said about 0.3%. So one might think that it was the right thing to do when you thought that the virus was 10 times as deadly as we think now. That's separate to, was it the right thing to do given what we know now? Uh, and in the book, we try to explore those kinds of questions. Um, my feeling is that, and Jason and I do differ quite a lot on some of these things, is that an ongoing lockdown now is immoral. Um, I think it's causing enormous amounts of suffering in terms of uh, economic growth. We've had in South Africa a 51% fall in GDP. 
And that doesn't just mean that people's livelihoods have been destroyed. It will have an effect on people's actual lives. Um, so the, you know, there's a there's a clear correlation between people's financial well-being and their health well-being over time. So people will live shorter lives. Some people will die of starvation. Some people who were locked out of hospital access will die because they they had cancer that would have been picked up in a screening exercise, but they couldn't go and get screened. Some people will have missed out on their TB meds or their AIDS medication and will die because of that. Um, now, in South Africa, we just just last night have said that we're going to move down to lockdown level one with being the least restrictive of the lockdown levels. Um, and one might think it's a step in the right direction, although there might be reason to think that one ought not to have a lockdown at all at this moment. Hmm. Uh, well, that's exactly the type of answer that I was expecting. If you were just giving me a, an answer of yes, no, I would have said, well, that's the end of the screen. Thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Uh, Jason, you have anything to add to that, to Mark's sentiment? Yeah, I think Mark is right to split the, the problem into two questions. Um, so the one is, what are the moral considerations? And the best way of really understanding that question is, what are the consequences, right? So there's, there's two different ways that government could have reacted, broadly speaking. They could have locked down or not locked down. And which way uh, has the best consequences? And Mark and I differ on that answer. So Mark thinks that, the best consequences are associated with outer lockdown. In other words, you don't lock down. Um, and I'm not so sure that's correct. Um, so Mark says that, the, for example, the mortality rate is much lower than we thought it was, and, and that's true, although it's only much lower than, than certain people thought it was. Um, what's interesting is that uh, seven months later, um, after the Imperial College study came out, Discovery has come to the same conclusion that the mortality rate is 0.3 to 0.4%, which is exactly what the Imperial College study said it would be, um, which was much lower than the World Health Organization at the time. But it was that Imperial College study that prompted the UK to lock down, um, and various other governments after that followed too. Um, so, you know, although, although we know we're not in the worst case scenario, uh, we're certainly not in a scenario which we, which we had no idea could be the case. Um, you know, the Imperial College study was widely regarded, and if if their numbers are correct, that mortality rate is still very serious. Um, and also there's other factors that you need to look at, for example, long-term organ damage. Um, a lot of people who are surviving are have a long-term chronic condition, and by a lot of people, it depends on the studies you look at. Those studies are incomplete. We don't yet have a full picture. But studies have suggested anywhere from 20% of people have long-term lung damage, including people who get the disease asymptomatically. Um, a lot of people have heart damage, kidney damage, um, liver damage, brain damage. Um, and these are, these are things that we still don't know about seven or eight months later. And that's why Mark's point that um, the decision we made back then uh, was very hard, uh, given that we didn't have any of this information, but it's still hard given the current information. Um, the current information is not complete. We, we're just not sure. What complicates matters further is that governments here has really done a shoddy job of the lockdown, right? So they've introduced all sorts of laws um, that are just quite absurd. Um, so we still have uh, this curfew, an ongoing curfew, and the reason for the curfew was to make sure that hospital beds were not as filled up um, because the reason was that a lot of car accidents and brawls happen at night, um, so they would reduce the hospital capacity. But now hospital beds are available, so it seems really silly to have a curfew. They had a no drinking rule, uh, no tobacco rule, or at least no distribution of, of alcohol. I mean, these are pretty crazy. Um, so it's very hard when, when we talk about whether or not to lock down to kind of define what we're talking about. You know, if you're talking about the way South African government did it, then Mark and I are going to have the same answer, which is that it was not politically legitimate, um, although perhaps we would differ on the consequences of the lockdown. The Mark discussed, for example, the economic consequences, and it's not clear to me that those economic consequences are from the lockdown specifically. Um, so you can look at certain countries that didn't lock down as severely or didn't lock down at all, like Sweden, and Sweden suffered almost identical economic contraction compared with its neighbors who locked down quite severely. But Sweden had far more death. So these are really, really complex questions with really complex answers. Um, and my personal view is that 
given where we were standing in February, a soft lockdown made sense. And by soft lockdown, I mean with none of the extraneous rules like don't drink or smoke um, and go to sleep by 10 p.m. lights out. Those seem very silly. But it made a lot of sense to me from the moral standpoint, it would have positive consequences to lockdown. Although the second question, which Mark discussed, is it politically legitimate for government to lock down? That's a separate question. And Mark and I both agree there that government is not it, government is not politically justified to withhold people's rights and to withhold their liberties um, under any circumstances, on my view and on Mark's view, under certain circumstances. And these would include that. We both arrived at the same conclusion that it was politically illegitimate, but we arrived at different conclusions about the consequences of a lockdown. But now that you mentioned the your two pronged approach with the legitimacy and the moral approach, um, Mark, you can start off. Uh, I'd like to hear your your take or your angle on the moral question regarding a lockdown. It doesn't even have to be specifically to South Africa, and then we can move to uh, Jason's view on it. So what we try to do in the book is we start with a thought experiment. So it's really a kind of narrative device to get people thinking about how you weigh up these moral decision-making questions. And it's a device that a lot of people will be aware of. It's called the trolley problem. And I'm going to give you a particular version of it. So you're standing on a bridge, and you can see that there is a train that is hurtling towards uh, five people who are tied to the track. And uh, if you do nothing, they're going to get killed by this train. And you're standing next to someone who's very overweight, um, sort of uh, big daddy liberty, Sikla Ngobesi, overweight. And we're talking about, you know, Sikla's a great guy and a good friend. I think he'll enjoy being a good And you look at him and you sort of say, I push this guy over the bridge. He's going to land on the, on the tracks. The train's going to hit him. It's going to kill him in a very brutal, visceral way. But I'm going to save those five lives. And you know that there's no way Sikla is consenting to this. He doesn't want to be tossed off the bridge, but you can save the lives. And the question is, do you have a moral obligation to do this because you can save five lives at the sacrifice of one? And a lot of people get very, very uncomfortable at that idea. They think that murdering someone to save lives is immoral. And the question is, is that what a government lockdown looks like? where basically what you do is you take an active step, like pushing someone off a bridge, knowing that you're going to cause um, damage to the economy and, as I said, to people's lives and to their health, um, with the hope that you're going to get some greater benefit out of it. And so that's the, the sort of device that we use to assess the moral, the moral situation. Um, and there's, there might be some level where you say, well, maybe if it was 100 people, you know, on those tracks, then maybe we could we could countenance the murder. So the utilitarians are going to sort of say, well, really, there's some there's some amount where it starts to get ludicrous that you're not willing to sacrifice the one to save the many. Um, the rights there says, no, there is no such number that you just don't murder people, that you don't take active steps to kill people. Might be different from allowing bad things to happen. Um, so, for example, we think there's a difference between a lifeguard who fails to save a drowning child and someone who actively puts a child's head under underwater and drowns it. That failing to save and, and actively killing are different. And really, I think lockdowns are these active measures. Um, they look more like killing with some noble end, um, which is to try and save lives and you know maybe even have long-term economic saving costs. So, for example, the approach taken by New Zealand is they say, look, we're hurting now. Um, you know, this is the worst economic state we've been in since we've started recording in our economic data. But we think we're going to have a very rapid recovery. And overall, when you have a long-term view on this, we're going to have saved a lot of lives and our economy will be better on track. And so they've taken a sort of long-term view about the consequences. That's the other thing that I think is quite important. When you're making these hard decisions, you can't just look at the immediate consequences of your action. You have to look at the consequences of the consequences. And I think often government has done in South Africa a very poor job of that. So for example, on the cigarette ban, the idea was, well, the immediate consequences are less people will smoke and that's a good thing for health. The secondary consequence is that you're not going to allow for any legal markets to be created. Um, you're not going to get any of the tax revenue that you would have been getting, which could have been used to you know, build more hospital beds. And you're going to fuel a criminal enterprise that may stick around for much longer than, than the pandemic. Those secondary consequences, you know, we think it's incumbent upon government to make, to at least be aware of. And that's what, uh, you know, uh, Frederick Bastiat's sort of 
draws the distinction between a good economist and a bad econ economist, good economists can see the sort of ramifications of the first order choice. Uh, Jason, before you uh, give your angle, could you just give a lead it in with a, a definition of what a utilitarian is for those that are not? Because this is something oh, that features a lot of people in your book. Sure. So um, basically, within um, ethics or morality, philosophy of morality, there's two, there's two main, there's two broad theories of what makes an action right. So when we try to assess whether an agent or a person is performing a right action, we look at two different theories. There's lots of others, but, but there's two main ones. Uh, and the one is utilitarianism, and it says that an action's right just in case it maximizes utility for society as a whole. And what do we mean by utility? We mean happiness. So does it, does it result in the most happiness for society? That, that would mean that that action is correct from a utilitarian perspective. Um, then you get what Mark called um, rights-based ethicists or, or Kantians or deontologists. Um, and what they think is that what makes an action right is that it fulfills certain duties and honors people's rights. So um, when you're standing next to the fat man on the bridge and you're thinking about pushing him over, the utilitarian is going to say, well, I want to add up everyone's happiness in this situation and see which 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 outcome has the most happiness overall. So if I don't throw the fat man or push the fat man off the bridge, these people on the track are going to die. Suppose there's five of them, five people will die. But the fat man will live. And the utilitarian is going to say, provided those five people have relatively happy lives, you are removing a lot of happiness in the world, whereas you are only saving a little bit, the fat man on the bridge. Whereas if you do push, push the fat man, you're, sa you're saving a lot of happiness in the world and only removing a little. And so the utilitarian would say, you've got to push the fat man. Um, the, the Kantian or the deontologist or the, the rights-based ethicist says, no, 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 you never violate someone's right. Um, regardless of the situation, ever, ever, you have a duty not to violate people's rights. You never use someone as a means to an end. That's the way they often put it. You never use someone as a means to an end or you don't disrespect the dignity of the humanity. And when you push that person off the bridge, you are disrespecting the dignity of the humanity. And the question in the lockdown case is, when you say to people, you may not move around, right? So you may not, when there's a curfew or, or there's just no movement permitted whatsoever, and you may not uh, operate your business, are you undermining people's dignity? Are you, are you undermining people's uh, humanity um, in order, as a means to an end, to save certain people that are vulnerable to COVID? So these are, these are the debates that the trolley problem, we call it the trolley problem, uh, evoke. And we thought that it's a very nice, um, it's a very nice uh, analogy to the lockdown decision. Whether or not you push the fat man is equivalent to whether or not you lock down society. Uh, and then, well, that's the, the, the moral side. And then the, when it comes to the legitimacy, legitimacy side or the political legitimacy side, um, there seems to be at a completely different angle. So, Mark, if you could uh, give us the, your take on the, the political legitimacy side of, uh, of lockdowns. Sure. So imagine a, a different uh, thought experiment. So you wake up in a hospital bed. You're covered head to toe in bandages. You've got a pretty severe case of amnesia, so you don't know your name, your age, your race, your sex, um, but you've got a pretty good working um, theory about human pathology and about economics. You're lying there in bed, sort of contemplating your state of affairs, and this uh, guy walks in wearing a white lab coat. And he says, I've got a once in a lifetime opportunity for you. I'm going to let you design the rules for the world that you step into once we take your bandages off. Um, so the idea is that you're behind what John Rawls calls this veil of ignorance. Um, it's his thought experiment, and he says you're in this original position. And the idea is that you want to try and design a rule that's going to be suit your rational self-interest, given what you don't know. So, for example, if you don't know your race, you're not going to create a rule which allocates uh, benefits and burdens on the grounds of race. You're not going to have racially discriminatory laws. You're not going to have sexist laws because if you say, you know, um, women only get to earn 70% of men and you turn off their woman, you've done a poor job, you've shafted yourself. So he thinks just out of rational self-interest, people are going to choose what he calls a set of equal basic liberties. The next thing is he thinks that you're going to want some kind of social safety net. You might wind up being quite vulnerable. You know, you could wind up being uh, the kind of person who's 
not smart enough to earn a good living. You might wind up with a physical disability. Uh, you might, you know, grow up in a poor household. And so maybe you want the state to play some kind of a role to provide this safety net. So, you know, to pay for or subsidize uh, an education or healthcare, things like that. And so what we try to do is think, well, if you're in the veil of ignorance and there's this uh, virus out there, what would you want the state to do? So you don't know if you're going to be elderly or have a comorbidity like um, hypertension or diabetes. Would you want a state imposed lockdown? Um, and given that lack of knowledge, if your answer is yes, um, in other words, you would have agreed under this condition of uh, veil of ignorance, um, and you think, yes, I would sign up to that contract, I would have agreed, then the state has legitimacy. Um, then they have done the right thing. Now, you might want a certain amount of information. So you might say, well, what are the chances that I'm going to wind up having one of these comorbidities that's going to lead to my death or to some other very serious affliction if I get, get the disease? What are the chances that I'm going to get the disease in the first place? And the other thing is, how efficacious is it going to be? Is this um, state-imposed measure going to actually work? So, I mean, here's one of the interesting sort of to return back to the facts. Um, one of the things that Discovery posits in, in their um, study is they say, look, government says South Africa has had 650,000 um, cases of COVID. They think it's 13 million, so 20 times the figure. Um, so, which means that um, roughly one in four South Africans have gotten COVID. So, and we had, you know, a very harsh lockdown. So, it might be that all the lockdown can do really is buy you time, um, but it can't stop the spread of the disease permanently. And so one of the things that we talk about in the book is when you're thinking about um, what the purpose of a lockdown is, um, and you're thinking about those lives on the track or the person who's sort of going to get the benefit of the lockdown in the veil of ignorance, we identify four people. So the first is the kind of person who gets COVID and is asymptomatic. They suffer nothing. Okay. Second is the kind of person who gets it, um, and but it's not so serious they need a hospital bed. Um, so they're able to sort of self-isolate at home. Um, the third is the kind of person who gets it and is going to die, um, regardless of whether they go to a hospital. Um, and the fourth is the kind of person who gets it. If they go to hospital, they'll survive. And really, a lockdown can only help that fourth category of people. Um, that's who you can save. In other words, if the purpose of a lockdown is that sort of flatten the curve, you know, so that you you don't have a very big spike in infection, then you wind up not overwhelming the health the healthcare system. And so basically what happens is that people trickle through the healthcare system as the available resources are available. Um, but you can't really try and eradicate it. Um, you know, New Zealand seems to be one of those few countries that's tried that approach, but they're also unique in the sense that it's an, it's an island um, and it's in a very far-flung part of the world. Um, and they, they acted very swiftly. And so they've had a very small number of cases, but they've also bearing the cost of isolating themselves from the rest of the world and from international tourism and are going to take all those economic hits as well. Uh, but now that you uh, mentioned the economic hits, uh, Jason, is there anything you want to add to the political legitimacy uh, question or the, the political legitimacy matter? Yeah, yeah. I, look, I think Mark's delineation of the four types of people is very useful. Um, it kind of gives us an idea of who lockdown is aiming to save or help. But I think it might be overly simplistic. So there's a few other things that lockdowns do that that complicate that picture. So the one the one complication is that lockdowns can give you time. So that time can be very very useful. There's a lot of treatments uh, for COVID which weren't available uh, in March when we decided to lock down, which now are available. And it could be that that what lockdown did was it allowed the world to catch up. To develop treatment so that those four categories were as they are now. If we hadn't locked down, there might have been more people in the category of will not survive without a hospital bed um, or won't survive at all, regardless of whether they get a hospital bed or not, which can now move to a different category um, because we now have medication that will help them. So uh, dexamethasone um, reduces the number of deaths uh, among ITU patients by a third. That's massive. Right? We just didn't have that when we first locked down. So locking down can shift the allocation of people to those different groups. The other complication um, is that in mortality or death is not the only relevant issue. Um, it's also long-term damage. Um, so 
it, it could very well be the case that the vast majority of people survive, in other words, they live through the disease, and yet quite a few of them develop long-term organ damage. And if the, the purpose of lockdown is to prevent those people from getting the, the disease at all, or from getting it at a much later stage when a vaccine is available or a very good treatment is available, then you might be saving a lot of people a lot of hardship, even if you're not saving them from death. So I think Mark's, uh, Mark's schema of the four different types of people is the right schema. But I think that it's very complicated when you look at what a lockdown does and how it impacts that schema. That's the first thing to think about. And um, the second thing to think about is this thought experiment uh, is Rawls's thought experiment, uh, John Rawls. And John Rawls thinks that the, pe the decisions that you make in the original position under the veil of ignorance, that's what he called it, the veil of ignorance, um, are the decisions that government should implement. They're the policies that government should implement. So what we do in the book is we discuss the various problems with Rawls's principle. So, for example, one of the problems with Rawls's principle is that he thinks that the people in the original position who don't know who they are and are trying to make decisions for society in which they will live once they realize who they are and they need to live, the, the decisions that they make uh, will, will follow what he, what he thinks is called the maximum min principle. So the maximum min principle tries to minimize horrendous results, right? So one of the, the results could be that you wake up from, from the veil of ignorance and you turn out to be elderly with a bad comorbidity. So you have heart disease and diabetes and hypertension, the whole lot. And so you're at, at very high risk. So, so what, what, what Rawls thinks is that in that kind of situation, if you're that person, you're going to kick yourself, right? And say, well, I should have implemented a law where there's a strong lockdown so that it would prevent me from getting the D. Um, and, and we both in the book think that that's not a very good way to reason. So we both think that um, using the maximum principle is not ideal. And so we drop Rawls' thought experiment and look at other possible ways of justifying political legitimacy, like libertarianism. So libertarianism is the view that um, the government should only ever act uh, in a way that reduces our freedoms or our liberties. The only time that's allowed is when it prevents us from harming another citizen. Um, and we look at whether that might be used to, to justify lockdown or to say that a lockdown is politically illegitimate. Um, and then we look at my favorite idea, which is anarchism. So anarchism is the view that government is never political. Um, the mark is more, more of a libertarian, I'm more of an anarchist, and we both come to the conclusion that under these circumstances, government was not politically justified in locking down. But there's very interesting questions around if COVID had been much worse. So um, if you don't want to think about it as COVID, think about it as the next pandemic, right? So, this pandemic uh, has a mortality rate of 0.3 to 0.4 percent at the moment, given the treatments that we have. Imagine it had a mortality rate of 30 to 40 percent. Imagine a third of all people who contract the disease die, and the rest, let's assume, survive under horrendous circumstances. They they lose limbs. They 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 have have horrible horrible. Um, horrible they have blood lives. coming out of their eyes. Blood coming out of their eyes. Yeah. So now, under those circumstances, would the libertarian say that you should lock down? Well, the libertarian would probably have to say you should lock down. Why? Because the libertarian says that um, you should prevent people from harming others. And if you're harming someone else by giving them a disease, well, then they can prevent you from doing that. Um, and so the libertarian has this uncomfortable position where he's got to say, yes, uh, a lockdown in these circumstances are not the right circumstances for lockdown. But there is some possible world, lots of like this term, possible world, there's some possible world or some future pandemic where we do think a lockdown would be correct. And they've got this very difficult task of drawing a line in the sand. At what point is, is a lockdown justified and at what point is it not? Whereas the anarchist says it is never politically justified. Um, and I think that's a simpler, a simpler solution. So that's, that's one I uh, but now that you mentioned libertarianism, there's actually a, a big debate within libertarian circles about the uh, wearing of masks, about uh, do you have a moral duty to wear a mask or should you not wear a mask as the fattest middle finger you can give to the government to pretty much say, I'm not going to even see this little bit of a centimeter. 
Uh, Mark, let's start with you. What is uh, seeing as you lean more libertarian? What are you, what are your thoughts about this conundrum that a lot of people, and I mean, I understand the the argument uh, on both sides. And what are you, what is your take on the the mandatory wearing of masks and whether you should do it if you're a freedom loving individual? Yeah, so I think it makes a big difference how if the mask's doing something. Um, so let's let's just take the strongest case um, as a, as a thought experiment. Let's assume that. Um, the mask was 100% effective, and that if you breathed on someone with COVID, you were definitely going to give it to them. Okay, um, and someone said, "Well, why why should I be required to to wear this thing? Um, you know, I'm not going to wear it." And let's assume that COVID then there was also 100% chance that it was going to kill people. We might think that starts to look like someone who sort of says, "Look, I've got this firearm, and I'm just going to fire it at will into crowds. And if you know they get hit by bullets, well, that's their thing. I've got this freedom, you know." And so John Stuart Mill. Um, who's sort of the, the father of classical liberalism says, well, people should have the freedom to swing their fists to the edge of my nose and no further, that our freedoms need to be mutually compatible. Um, and I need to be to, able to live a life that is as free as possible without intruding on, on your freedoms so that you can continue to live your life. So if we are in this sort of very bleak scenario that I've painted where the mask really um, does, it does have some level of dignity impact. I think walking around, people can't see your face. Um, where you, I wear glasses, so wearing a mask means that my eyes get fogged up. Uh, I, I don't find it very pleasant to wear a mask. Um, but assume you could save lives. You might think that really what it is is that my, my breath going out into the world is like this fist and it's busy clobbering people to death. Okay. But now let's peel that back a little bit. So it's not clear that cloth masks uh, are going to have that level of efficacy. Um, we know that, for example, uh, N95 masks are much more efficacious, but um, you know you can't wear them day in and day out. You know it's a disposable mask, um, and the public has been told not to go and buy them because there's a limited amount and it should be kept for healthcare practitioners. So then you start to say, well, what? How much good is this mask doing? Um, and there's some interesting data on that. I think we've got some uncertainty. The one view is that what it does is that it reduces the viral load. Um, so you're not stopping the transmission, you're just stopping the amount of the virus that is getting transmitted to someone else. Um, and that might be a good thing. So what it might mean is that people then who get low viral loads get less severe cases. Um, and so you might be involved in some kind of grand inoculation project where people aren't dying because they're not getting severe viral loads. And then you might think, well, there's some good that's coming out of the mask. But I mean, the, the sort of scientific consensus on this is very unclear. Um, so one of my favorite podcasts is a show called Science Versus, and they've run three episodes on masks. And the first two basically say, look, we don't think there's enough data to support the, the use of cloth masks. Um, maybe it does something. Um, but the worry about someone wearing a mask, which they think acts like a full shield, is that they then act as if um, they you know, they don't need social distance, so they can be right in your face. They can you know, do all the kind of stuff that you would have done in a normal society and actually introduce high risks. There was also a concern that if you're getting COVID on your hands and then you're touching your, your mask to adjust all the time, you could have greater infections. Their third episode basically says, look, we think there is now enough information that shows that masks have some efficacy. And the example they give is a hairdresser who had COVID, wore a mask, had 400 customers, and none of those customers got it. Um, so they think it might be doing something to prevent the spread of the disease. Um, so I, I think you've got to be very sensitive to the information as it comes in. I think what's interesting about masks is how politicized it's become. So, you know, people have sort of said, well, to defy the government, I'm not going to wear a mask. And you might think that, you know, that's, that's a way of expressing your disdain for a strong arm state. Um, but your political view should be different from the, what's actually going on on the ground. In other words, there is a fact of the matter about whether masks are doing anything good or bad. And we need to know that. And you need to spend some time thinking about that. And it should be related to what we think the moral thing to do is. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on the mask question? Seeing as you're more of an anarchist, uh, there might be a different angle. <laughs> I, I think Mark's point about uh, politicizing these kind of decisions is very important. Um, but that's why in the book what we do is we split the moral question from the political question. So the moral question purely looks at what, what is going to happen if you do wear a mask or don't wear a mask. What is going to happen if you do lock down, don't lock down. Do you push the fat man onto the tracks or don't push the fat man onto the tracks? There's, there's a fact of the matter, right? There is a biological, there is a virus that is not a political entity that will will kill you or won't kill you at a certain rate. 
right? And will cause damage or won't cause damage at a certain rate. And so there is there is a fact of the matter what the ethics involved is, what the morality is involved. But, but when people talk about the politics involved, that's where it gets so much more complicated. And I think if people were to take these two questions and separate them out, there would be a much, much better debate happening. But at the moment, what's happening is that the world is polarizing into two different camps. So the one camp is saying, uh, COVID is not a serious disease. It's no worse than flu. So they make a decision on the morality. And why do they make that decision? Because they want a certain political decision to be made. And the political decision is, it's illegitimate that we've been treated this way by governments, right? So they change their evaluation of the ethics or the morality involved to suit their political stance. But I think that's an error. It's an error because it's not sensitive to the truth and because um, you don't have to go that far. You can still hold the political view. You can still hold the view that government is illegitimate in locking down and still think that the disease is serious. And so if we apply that framework to masks, I think Mark is right that the, the, the data about masks has shifted over time. More and more data is coming out to suggest that mark, masks are efficacious in some way. But there is, a, a, there is a, a difficult question here, which is how politically motivated is that data? It has now become uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of on the left, the, the, uh, the right thing to say that masks are important and you must wear a mask. That is going to then skew the data that comes out about masks. So, you know, we don't want the data to be skewed either way, by either side um, of this debate. We don't want this polarization. Um, but then the question is, given that the data is unclear, what do you do, right? And, and there I think the answer is the same answer as in the lockdown case, which is that you perform the less risky option. So philosophers talk about defeasibility. So the feasibility is where you've got two choices, two possible decisions that you could make, and one is going to lead to outcomes that you cannot take back, right? You, you, once you go down that track, you cannot ever change. You cannot get off it, right? Once you send, send the train down that track, it is going to do what it is going to do, and you cannot divert that train. That is an option that you don't really want to take. And the problem with not locking down is that you are sending that train down a track that is going to kill a lot of people, but how many you don't know yet. You don't know whether it's going to be 3.4% or 0.6% or 0.3%. You don't know in February which of those it is. But it is indefeasible or undefeasible. Once it gets going, once you open up society, those people are going to get infected and they're going to die. And then you will later find out how many there were. Whereas if you do lock down, it is a defeasible option. In other words, at any time, you can lift that, lift that lockdown. And I think the same with masks. We don't yet know how efficacious they are. But there is, some, there is some evidence that they might be. And so it seems prudent to wear them, right? The ethical, the ethical decision seems to be to wear them. Why? Because they might be efficacious. And so the defeasible option is to wear the mask. And so I think that is the right thing. Uh, Mark, when you and me talked the first time, and it was way back when <laughs> the when the lockdown started, feels like decades ago. Uh, I titled that episode uh, "COVID 1984." I remember, but yeah, um, I, we we dealt with the question very briefly about vaccination because uh, I had uh, uh, someone uh, in person ask me, "But what if I don't want to uh, take the vaccine? What if I am suspicious about it? Or uh, does the government have power to?" Uh, force me to do it but uh, and you answered that question from a legal perspective but let's go into a more of a moral perspective in regards to a, a vaccine let's say the the person in this uh, in this scenario is very uh, cautious or wary or suspicious of this vaccine they genuinely feel like it would lower their quality of life they let's not even get into what they suspect it might do let's say it's going to worsen their life maybe even threaten their life what is the moral or philosophical perspective in terms of that uh, forcing that person then to, to take a vaccine uh, from a utilitarian perspective that would be seen as the group? Uh, yes, so I suppose there's a couple of questions. The one is, you know, we're talking about creating a vaccine under totally bizarre conditions. So ordinarily, vaccine development takes a decade or decades. Um, and the idea is that we're going to produce something within 18 months. 
Um, so there's a concern that you could wind up developing a vaccine that has very negative consequences down the line. So ordinarily, when you're trialing a vaccine, you you check out, you know, is it going to have side effects? Is it going to have side effects for everyone or for certain people or for certain, you know, clusters of people? Um, and you, you try and find out before you go and, you know, mass roll it out. So the person who says, look, I'm suspicious of, of taking a vaccine has some reason to be suspicious because it's not gone through the ordinary trialing process. Um, the same token, you have a global effort to try and develop a vaccine very rapidly um, and to to do something that, you know, is sort of, let's say, maybe was seen as less urgent in other ways. Uh, vaccines generally as well do have side effects. There's a vaccine court in the States which pays for vaccine injuries. I think they've paid out uh, $3 billion worth of compensation to people who've suffered injuries. Um, some of the things that happen to people are... Um, very alarming to look at, but don't have long-term consequences. So I think one in 10,000 children who takes a certain kind of vaccine will have a seizure. So you can imagine, you know, you take your, your kid off to the doctor, they get this vaccine, and they start writhing around and frothing from the mouth. That's a hell of an alarming thing to watch. But apparently has no long-term consequences. And you've now managed to protect them from, let's say, getting polio um, or, you know, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, but there are some people who have, you know, long-term consequences, but it's very, very rare. So one of the questions is under what conditions could you require vaccination so what some public schools have done for example is they say look we we're going to subsidize your child's education if you come to our school and in exchange for that you've got to agree to get this vaccine so you don't get all the other kids sick and but if you don't want to do that that's fine go to a private school or homeschool um if you if you give people no choice whatsoever that seems like a very very severe infringement of people's personal autonomy of their bodily integrity uh, especially under conditions where you're not quite sure what's going to happen. Um, that kind of, you know, grand experiment um, strikes me as something that, you know, they should be deeply uncomfortable about. Other thing as well is, what's the benefit? So if you want to reach herd immunity, the general feeling is you need about 60% of people to, to be vaccinated or to have had the thing. Um, so the virus will then die out because basically when it's spreading around, it's, it's hitting enough null zones um, where it's not able to kind of keep spreading. So you might think that government man saying having a policy of saying you will get a vaccine could backfire spectacularly because you'll get a huge amount of resistance to it. A lot of people will refuse who would have otherwise volunteered uh, and you would have reached your herd immunity under a situation where you allowed people to do it voluntarily. Um, so my instinct is that a lot of people will try and pick a vaccine. A lot of people are, are volunteering right now to be um, to be test subjects because they, you know, they, they want an outcome, you know, they're willing to take that risk. Um, you know, they're young, they might have elderly parents, they want to sort of, you know, get rid of COVID as quickly as they can. And so I think a lot of people will voluntarily sign up. Um, but for those that don't want to, I don't think they pose enough of a risk to the rest of us that we ought to compel them to do it. Mm. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on the on the vaccine question? I mean, I think it's an elegant solution that Mark has, um, but again, there's, there's an empirical complication. Um, so the empirical complication is that a vaccine is not 100% effective, certainly not for coronavirus. Um, so, for example, when you look at the flu vaccine, they're generally only 40 to 60% effective. Now, that means that if you were to give it, Mark was saying you need 60% um, of the population for herd immunity. So let's assume that is correct. Let's say you give it to 60% of people, they reckon that for the coronavirus vaccine, it will only be roughly 50% effective. That means of those 60%, only half will be immune. And so you've effectively only given the vaccine to 30% of the population because the other 30% that's not immune, it's as though they never got the vaccine at all. Um, so at least from the perspective of the virus, they can still be infected. Um, so, so the complication here is that in order to reach that 60% herd immunity, and given that the, the vaccine's only going to be about 50% effective, you really want 100% of your population to get it. And, and the worry is that if you don't, uh, it, it, there is a necessary condition on that happening. And the necessary condition is that you make it law. Now, it's not a sufficient condition, because as Marcus said, you could make it law and people rebel and refuse to get it. Right? That could happen. But it seems clear that if you don't make it a law, you will not get 100% vaccination. There, is enough, there are enough anti-vaxxers out there that they will not, you will not reach 100%. And so the, 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 
the, the decision with the best outcome might be to make it 100% uh, obligatory and to have a very firm hand on this and, and, and tie people down and give them the vaccine. Now, that is, that is again, the moral thing to do, right? have the best outcome. But it is not politically legitimate, right? The amount of, of coercion that would be required from the state to do this, if so, if so, it would it would it would involve so many uh, violations of our rights and our, our liberty that um, that it seems abominable, right? You don't want to do that to people. You don't want to tie them down and give them the vaccine. Um, so again, there's the split of these two questions. Moral question, the political, the political legitimacy question. But it may very well be the case that making it 100% required by everyone will have the best outcome, even though we should not do that. Um, and then something else that uh, I think is very important to this whole uh, this whole debate around lockdown is pretty much what you, you mentioned in the book and earlier in the chat was about the, the unintended consequences or the or the knock on consequences that uh, pertains to, for example, the economy now. Mark, do you think that economic, and I mean, I ask this question because I've seen throughout the lockdown now so many people just brush off the economic impact and say this is this is trivial, this is this pales in comparison to the, the health effects and the misery that is going to be caused by the pandemic. Do you think that type of attitude or that type of brushing off comes from economics or the economy, the trademark, being too distant or too abstract for people to really take it into account. What do you think is at play here where people so easily and smart people, not just people that sort of don't know what's going on, people that really are very smart people looking at the situation and just nonchalantly brushing off the economic effects as, as if it's, it's inconsequential. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on. The one, as you say, is a line of sight problem. So, you know, when we think about our trolley example, we can very vividly imagine Sekhler being thrown off the tracks and the other five people there. But once you've once you've gone down a certain track, in the distance, there's the economy, you know, and there's all the, the jobs that will be lost and all the sort of suffering from those livelihoods. And what you've got to try and do through an imaginative exercise is bring those people forward into your minds and think this suffering is going to happen. Um, and not all that suffering is just about, oh, I won't be able to buy myself a new iPhone for Christmas. You know, some of it is people are going to starve to death, you know. Um, there will be mass social unrest. And we've seen that in the States. And it's something we, we write about in the book is that if you, if you destroy an economy, you know, you have a whole bunch of people who are out of work um, who are going to, going to get involved in rioting and looting and levels of crime. I mean, we've seen America engulfed in you know, multi-state protests. I mean, I think at one point it was protests in 50 cities around America. Uh, Portland has had 100 days of protests. A lot of it quite violent. A lot of stores have been looted. Now, some of it, you might think, in other words, the simple analysis is this was just a response to, uh, you know, the injustice of George Floyd being killed. Um, but some of it is you've created an environment where people have been locked out of work, have been cooped up at home, um, and this is why you've had this sort of surge. Um, and so there are these secondary effects, and it's very useful to try and think about them. Here's the other reason why I think you might have some very smart people saying this stuff, poo-pooing it. One is they have a government job, and in South Africa, they've then earned a salary for the last six months without having to do a, a, a drop of work. Uh, you know, so this is a dream for them. It's amazing. You, know, you get to get the salary. Uh, it's guaranteed. Awesome. The other is you work in an industry where you know you could work from home and you could continue your business and you didn't have to worry about being retrenched and a lot of knowledge workers are in that situation now i'd love to see one of those people go and tell one of the three million south africans who did lose their jobs yeah the economy doesn't matter you know that person is now you know had their livelihoods decimated um it it very much matters to them you know um and this is one of the sort of concerns that we had with the sort of essential worker line you know Every job is essential for the person who has it. And if they don't have that job, you know, they're going to be pushed into poverty. A lot of South Africans are really a, a paycheck away from poverty you know, um, and didn't have the kind of access to credit that people had. We also didn't have the government bailout that you had in other countries. So in America, they injected $3 trillion into their economy. Americans got checks. You know, businesses got bailouts. What happened in South Africa was a very small amount of money was used for those purposes. Some of it was stolen. Um, 
So this idea that you could kind of have a one size fits all model, you know, I think is also inaccurate. I think that there was a certain amount of rope that you could burn through. So Jason is right to say, look, one of the benefits you get from a lockdown is just buy time. And you say, okay, look, we don't know what's going on. There's a whole bunch of uncertainty. If we can buy enough time so that we can get our house in order, we can get the sort of, um, you know, build some more hospital beds or wait for some sort of uh, treatments to be available. That's good. But different countries had a different amount of time available to them before, you know, cataclysm happened. And we had a lot less rope available to us. In Malawi, for example, when the government wanted to institute a lockdown, Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world. There was a court case that said, no, you can't do it. You are going to drive people to starvation. Unless you have a plan for dealing with that, you can't institute a lockdown. Um, and they were able to interdict the government from doing that. And Malawi's had very, very few COVID deaths. Partly they're also, you know, far flung part of the world. In a lot of other countries had locked down, so there wasn't a sort of flood of international travel. So they haven't had, you know, COVID sort of, you know, reek through them. That's the other thing we've got to recognize as well, is that it really has affected different countries differently. Um, so if you go and look on Worldometer and you sort of rank the number of deaths, you know, certain countries have had enormous numbers of deaths, like America, Brazil, India, Russia. Um, other countries have had deaths in the tens, you know, or the hundreds, or the very low thousands. Um, when you're looking at deaths as well, I mean, there's a complicated thing to do. So the rough calculation that Discovery have come up with is that 750 billion rand was lost from our, in our economy. Um, 16,000 lives they reckon were saved through instituting lockdowns, which is a cost at 46 million rand a life. Now, if I told you it's going to take 46 million rand to save your mother, you'd say, well, let's get the money. It's my mother. My mother's life is invaluable. But if you work in the public healthcare sector and I say, look, every life's going to cost you 46 million rand, you say, well, we only have so much money. You know, how do we, how do we best use our money to save lives? You know, there are only so many dialysis machines we can spend on. There's only so much we can put into malaria pills. You know, we, we value lives through rands in some sense. It's a cold hearted analysis. Um, so again, you want to have this context dependent attitude towards, towards your lockdown. And it's not going to be the same in every country around the world. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on uh, why people can't see the the economic effects or so easily brush off the, the economic effects without really giving it a, a second thought? I think Mark is correct that there's a sort of a line of sight problem. People can't see that far down the track. I think that's right. I think a lot of people can only see one step ahead. Um, so I, I love playing chess. Um, I was a cycling chess champion when I was younger and well in my age group and what made a good chess player was that you could think ahead uh, and it's the difference between a good chess player and a bad chess player and what you really want in your government is a very good chess player right you want someone who can think of the consequences of the consequences of the consequences of what they do you want them to think 20 moves deep and it seems like our government really doesn't do that um, or perhaps they do but in a pernicious way so they don't mind uh, uh, the economy uh, being destroyed if it serves their goals um, for or radical economic uh, transformation, whatever it is. Um, so, so there's definitely that. There's a line of sight problem and maybe a perniciousness problem as well. But I, there, there also could be a different, a different reason why that plays plays a role some of the time. Um, and this is a reason that might be justified. Um, and and that is that, well, what what is economics? Well, economics is a way of of us trading. Uh, uh, um, getting money so that we can live, so that we can buy goods, so that we can trade those goods, so that we can we can live a life, right? We can get the services we need, the healthcare services, other types of services that are very important to us. Yeah, but addressing really, the problem of scarcity. Yes, but 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 really, um, it's not the money that matters at all. The money is purely a means to an end, and the end is my survival on one level, and then my flourishing once I've survived. Right, so I want enough money to survive and then enough money to flourish. And when you threaten people's existence, when you say to them, there is a disease out there and there is a chance, and back in February we thought it was a very good chance, that you will die if you contract the disease, right? You will die. If no amount of money will help you because back then there were no treatment. If you die, you die. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. No amount of money. Then they start to think, okay, all right, there will be economic impact to a lockdown, I won't die. 
And that, that type of reasoning is not necessarily bad reasoning. When you are faced with an existential threat, it makes sense to sacrifice a lot uh, to prevent that existential threat from coming from 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 coming true, from happening. Right? You don't want to die. Um, then the question becomes, what what is the risk of that threat happening? Right? And back then we thought it was a lot higher than we do now. Um, but remember, you know, the decision to lock down was taken back then, and it's 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 still scary today. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is these economic contractions, right? So Mark was absolutely right to say that um, said that 13 million people have contracted the disease at roughly 0.3 to 0.4 percent mortality rate, according to Discovery, um, and that we 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 lost all of this money um, and we saved 16,000 lives at roughly 46 million rand per life. Right. The problem is in that assumption is that Mark is assuming that all of that economic loss was because of lockdown. And it clearly is not the case. Why? Because again, we have countries like Sweden who have lost an enormous amount of their GDP, almost identical amount of their GDP to all their neighbors, like Norway, and yet they didn't lock down. So there are other reasons why there are economic losses. Now, that's not to say lock, lockdown results in no e economic damage. It absolutely does result in some. But just how much is very unclear. So if if you start to reduce that number, you know, it's a very similar exercise to Mark's exercise of saying, well, there's four different types of patients, right? There's people who will get the disease and be fine. There's people who get the disease, need a hospital bed, etc. There's also different types of economic loss. So there's economic loss as a result of the lockdown. There's economic loss as a result of the world experiencing economic loss. So when America sneezes, we get a cold. Right? That's, that's the classic saying. Um, there are impacts on our economy when other economies suffer. And then there's economic loss from people afraid of the virus and not engaging in certain economic activity that they would have otherwise, like going to a restaurant or a movie. And then there's economic loss that is a result of a change in our lifestyle. So, for example, we've now largely chosen to work from home. And, and I have a feeling that that will persist long after lockdown lifts, long after COVID disappears. There has been a shift in our society in the way that we do things. And that is not all due to lockdown. Um, and, you know, that, that is going to result regardless of what happens with lockdown and what happens with COVID. We are doing things differently now, partly because we weren't really satisfied with the way we were doing things before. And that is going to result in massive economic turmoil. For example, uh, people living in a city will no longer be allowed to charge exorbitant rates to rent out their properties. Um, there's, no, there's no good reason now to live in, in a city that is close, where it's close to work because you're not, you're not commuting to work anymore, right? So what we've seen is a massive increase, a spike in sales of properties in the country, for example in the countryside, because people want to live in a nice environment if they're going to work from home. They want it to be more spacious, they want it to be more green, and that is going to result in a loss of, of revenue for people who live in the inner city, regardless of COVID, right? But they, you know, it's kind of like when, if you lived in the time of the Industrial Revolution. If you were someone who did calligraphy in the Industrial Revolution when the printing press was invented, you're in big trouble. You lost your livelihood, right? The calligraphers all went out of work. They weren't writing magazine articles anymore. It was printed. And they were horrified. They said, this is terrible. We've suffered massive losses. This industry has been destroyed. And yet we look back on that today and we say, that was a necessary development, right? It was a necessary development that we created the printing press. And in the long run, we have a better outcome. And I think that's the case whenever there's a technological advance. One of the things that's happened with COVID is there's been technological advance, which has resulted in a short-term economic loss, but maybe a long-term economic gain. But all of this is not to say that lockdown has been okay for businesses. Lockdown has been disastrous for a lot of businesses. I'm just saying that to attribute all of the economic loss to lockdown is a mistake. Hmm. Uh, and then my last question for both of you, I'll start with you, Mark, uh, is a question relating to your, your passion in life or 
one of your other interests and this is uh for you is the question of the debates regard, regarding uh, the legality of uh, lockdowns and in, in legal circles what has come to the fore and what principles have really been given a new a new uh, relevancy in, the, in this new era uh, so my question would be uh, from your perspective in legal circles and maybe to your uh, that you like or dislike uh, what principles and debates have come to the fore now due to lockdowns that you think are very necessary and that you are that you welcome yeah it's been a hell of an interesting time to be a lawyer so i was involved in quite a lot of um, uh, anti-lockdown litigation so and we managed to get some i think quite important victories um, what, what's unusual about it was you know, you had, um, instead of the usual passage of law, which is through a lengthy process through parliament and lots of debate, you basically had law by decree overnight. You know, literally, you know, within the next hour, alcohol is now banned, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And so ordinarily things proceed through courts also in quite a long, lengthy way. And so all lockdown matters had to be dealt with urgently. And so we had to work out what are those parts of the regulations that are unreasonable, that are you know, trespassing on our rights in a way that cannot be justified? So we identified a few things for clients. So the one was there was a ban on e-retail. And the argument was, well, if we're going to force all these brick and mortar stores to close, well, then it's unfair to allow these guys to operate online. Um, and we said, this is not a matter of fairness. The reason you're closing the brick and mortar stores down is basically you want to stop the spread of a disease. Some of those guys you close down will be able to trade if you let them trade online. It's a way of kind of at least keeping the economy alive to some extent, um, you know, without you putting a full pillow on it. So we fought that and we won. Uh, the other one was this narrow exercise window. So, you know, people were able to leave their houses between, I think, six and nine in the morning at one stage. Um, and we said, this is massively unreasonable. You're funneling people into the same spaces. And we fought that. Um, so there was also a move to have... Um, forcible quarantines uh, for people who are able to self-isolate and we again said this is not generating any benefits you're just you and you're infringing on people's freedom and dignity in a, in a severe way and taking up hospital beds that could be used by people who don't have a place to self-isolate so we fought that and we won um now what's interesting is that i think some organizations were quicker off the bat than others um some were quick off the bat with bad cases and they and they lost um others were sort of more careful about the battles that they that they fought. Um, some have been tied up in appeals. So there were some, for example, the uh, De Beer case. There was a there was an initial victory, and that's not being appealed. So the benefits haven't actually come out of it. But I think it's very important that civil society keeps pressure on government, um, because you know the worry is that if you cede power to the state. They might give some of it back once the crisis is over, but not all of it, you know. And basically, you know, there's a there's this famous book called Crisis and Leviathan, which is that the, the state tends to enlarge itself during these crisis periods, and then it stays fat. Um, and we've definitely seen our our South African government, you know, just be so happy when they were deploying, you know, army into the streets and you know arresting. 300,000 South Africans for walking their dogs or, you know, being a minute late in curfew and, you know, really lording their power over us. I mean, we still have a bedtime, for goodness sakes, you know, I mean, this sort of idea of like, you know, the daddy government who just wants to look after us you know, is really kind of outrageous. And I do think a lot of organizations have been way too quiet, way too compliant. Um, but some brave few have gone to court and they've fought and they've won. Sometimes they've fought and they've lost, but they've given information to the rest of us. Um, and so it's been a hell of an exciting time to be a lawyer. Um, and and I think it's been interesting to sort of see how we've managed to grapple with this the situation, you know, that is so unprecedented. I think the press have generally been very poor. Um, I think that what we've kind of found is a, a lapdog press, which is sort of Whatever government policy it is, they love it. Um, they don't really like the PPE corruption stuff. But beyond that, whatever other liberties you want to take for us, government, go right ahead. Uh, and, and that's kind of a worry. But it's also meant that channels like yours have grown in greater prominence. So if we think about you know, people in the alt media space, um, you know, Ramon Kamenak with, with uh, The Morning Shot and Ronaldo Coase, um, you know, these guys have grown their, their channels dramatically during this time because people really have a hunger for an alternative view. And I think that's quite important. Um, there's a lot to be said for, I mean, Jason and I, in the writing of this book, disagreed with each other a lot. Um, and that was useful. It made us think, well, maybe you've got a point. Maybe I need to go and research that. Let me think about this. What about the implication of that? What about this? 
that's vitally important. That's how our legal system works as well. We have a clash of swords. We have two sides with competing views, and you're fighting it out to try and get to the truth, and the judge has sort of decided, and you're doing this through repetition. That's hell of important. That's why you don't want just the sort of loudspeaker state telling you this is what to believe, and if you, if you, if you don't like it, we're going to lock you up. I mean, there's nothing more paternal uh, than a state telling you when to go to bed and giving you a curfew like a very strict parent. Now, Jason, my final question to you in terms of something that uh, you are very passionate about is uh, as a science fiction novelist, what type of themes during this lockdown period and this pandemic period uh, do you expect firstly to see in future uh, science, science fiction works? And for yourself, uh, what type of inspirations have you maybe uh, even spotted during this very uh, strange time? I mean, it's a good question because um, the type of science fiction that I write is dystopian science fiction. Um, so I like to write about horrible futures. Uh, and it's quite hard to write dystopian science fiction when you're living in a horrible future already. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people said that about Donald Trump, uh, which which I don't agree with. I actually quite like Trump. Um, I don't think he's handled the virus well, but I think in general he's pretty cool. Um, but I think it's undoubtedly the case that the virus has been a bad thing. Um, those who think that the virus doesn't have a severe mortality rate, you can still agree that it has, the government in response has created an environment which is really awful. Um, and so, you know, we are living very, very difficult lives, whether you agree that to the virus itself or to, to government decisions or to health care, whatever it is. Um, we're living a very difficult life. And I think that the kind of um, the kind of environment that we can expect to grow into over time is quite uh, worrying in a different way. So one of those ways is that um, something that was wonderful before lockdown happened, before coronavirus kind of reared its head, was that we were developing uh, less and less fear around disease. Um, so, um, for example, uh, when it came to sex, we had such good preventative measures for HIV. We had something called PrEP, um, we still do, uh, that people were much more, they were much happier to have sex and not to worry about disease. Uh, not to worry about HIV transmission. And some people think of that as a terrible thing, um, but I think of it as a wonderful thing. I think it's great that people uh, felt more free and felt less fear around something quite fundamental to their lives around the sex. And COVID has changed that completely. Uh, people are now deeply worried about germs. They're very, they're very worried about disease. And I think that is a bad thing. I think what it's going to do is it's going to reduce the amount of contact, sexual or just physical, that we have with each other. I think that we will spend less time in each other's company. Technology is going to play a much bigger role in our lives. And you talked about inspiration. I think the inspiration in this is technology. Technology is going to grow and improve at such a massive pace now um, because of, of COVID that we, we're going to very quickly um, start to live in a virtual world. Facebook today announced that they're going to have AR glasses as standard with the future Facebook user interface. AR is augmented reality. So in future, you're going to get your pair of glasses that you're going to wear when you interact with people on Facebook. And it's going to allow you to see all of your friends within a virtual space. So I don't know if you've seen um, the movie uh, Ready Player One. That's what they're really going for. They're going for uh, a virtual space that we're going to live in in future. Now, these are really cool developments. Um, but something is also lost, and that is human contact, and the fear around human contact. And I think long after the last COVID-19 case is, is gone, we are still going to continue living with that fear. It's going to change our society. It's going to change our interactions with each other. We're no longer going to shake hands. We're no longer going to hug each other hello casually. Um, life is going to be different. We are going to see less of each other, and that is going to have huge psychological effects, um, along with the development in technology. Oh, well, I think that's a very very interesting sentiment to end it on. Uh, it's just uh, one final thought here from the chat. Sideline Opinion says, thank you, gentlemen, for an interesting, although somewhat controversial discussion. Fortunately, philosophy thrives on differing opinions. I also think that's a good thing. So uh, thank you very much for giving me some of your valuable time to talk about your book and the themes specifically in your book. Uh, for those that are still listening, uh, if you are interested in buying their book or look, uh, having a look at it, uh, you can find it at the link in the description. Uh, everything is there and then also thank you very much for everyone that tuned in and put their their feedback and their questions and everything in the chat 
And uh, once again, thank you very much to, to you two gents for joining me. And uh, I hope you have a very nice rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, Les. All right. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. And uh, I hope you enjoy your weekend.